More ways to make HTML. Okay, to get started, let's review where our code is at the moment. Here at the top, we we're importing Jester plus some standard library items. We have a constant that's a string for our register form. Here's the HTML here. Uh, and right here, we're showing any uh, errors that may be imported into it. Uh, we have our routes for Jester. We have the index page. We have the register form page, two different versions of it based on what the URL's looking like. Here is our uh, post for register form and our response to that post. And it read, read, read the redirects back to the register form because there was an error in it, or it goes on to hello page. Now, this method of just doing string substitution works in a pinch, and it certainly works very well for a small web page, but it's not particularly flexible, and it gets much more complicated, like, say, when you want to have a list of items or want to do something much more sophisticated and complex. And so we're going to go through a series of ways in which you could do HTML generation, essentially creating the string that's being sent back from the response. This particular video is going to go through three of those, and then in the next video, we're going to go through the Mustachu library, which is the one I'll be using for the rest of the series. So let's do the first, HTML gen. HTML gen is part of the standard library, so all we have to do is put an import statement at the top to get to it, and it literally builds HTML using a series of macros. Um, as you can see here, they're giving an example where uh, h1 generates a headline, and then they're creating a link, and essentially you're doing an embed of embed of embed of a macro. Uh, let's go ahead and rewrite our code to use this. Okay, let's go over the procedure I just wrote. Uh, here it is. We have a procedure called register form, and it's being passed in a string, returning a string. And the result of this is HTML. There's our first macro coming from HTML gen, uh, bounded by parentheses around here. And then within that, we have a list, starting with a head macro with a title macro inside of it, again, matching to what we're building here, then a body macro, an H3 macro, some just plain text, which we'll just dump in directly, paragraph macro, bold macro. You see the pattern here, uh, form macro. Uh, with the uh, elements inside the form. Now, uh, one quick thing to point out here, notice that the method uh, parameter is being passed with backticks. And that is because method is in fact also a keyword in NIM. And so you, if you just typed in method equals post, it'd think you're trying to define a new method, which is not what we're doing. We're actually declaring what the method is for the form. This is the method get around that. And down here in the routes, we are responding with our register form, passing in our one parameter. And uh, let's go make sure that this works. Oops, some kind of error. Oh, forgot a comma. What? Oh, <laughs> you do still have to import HTML gen. There we go. There we go. Let's run it. Here we go. The site is up. Let's take a look at register form. There's our HTML being generated automatically. Let's put in a bad value. I just put an empty email address. And bam, there's our error message displayed. Okay, next let's add a little bit of complexity to this register form. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it possible to have multiple error messages instead of one. I'll be right back. All right, let's look at our code now. A uh, register form, instead of taking a single string, is now taking an error list, a sequence of strings, right here. And we're building up this center of that, of a uh, essentially a unnumbered list, which is here. So starting off with an empty message string, uh, if the error list has more than zero entries in it, 
uh, we start building out the inner string, which is a list of list items with bolded messages for each item in the error list. And then it builds the overall message tray saying errors found in a paragraph plus uh, the unnumbered list with of, uh, list items in it. Okay, and then we're going back to our regular stuff. We're now substituting this spot right here with the actual message string which is built. And it defaults to empty if in fact there are no messages. So you won't see anything if there's no messages. Uh, I've written a check email format, which of course takes the email and it returns a sequence of strings or a sequence of errors. Uh, it defaults to nothing, uh, an empty error list. Uh, at first it checks to see if there's too few or too many at symbols. And then it checks to see if there's any spaces in the email address, and of course it checks to see if the email is empty. So it is in fact possible to get more than one error now with this, uh, with an email address. And we'll test that out here in a moment. Uh, over here we've just modified the uh, get and post section to take this. Um, it's passing the list of errors separated by bars. And, uh, and then, of course, when it's receiving the list of errors, it's separating them by bars and passing in the list for our form at the top there. So uh, let's try this out and see if it works. Well, it compiled. <laughs> let's see if it runs. All right, we've got our form. And let's put in, well, let's just put in some letters, which should have too few errors, uh, too few at symbols. There we go, too few at symbols. And something at something at something. Well, that's too many at symbols. And let's put too many at symbols. And let's put some spaces in there. There we go, it contains too many spaces. So now we have a more flexible error display to work with here. Now in the long run, passing errors through the URL is not the ideal way to do it, and we can't pass it through as a post. Uh, my experience is, is the most elegant way, and in fact I've written a library for doing this to work with Jester, is to pass display messages that occur between pages, and it can be more than just errors. It could be displaying, say, uh, success messages or informational messages or any kind of notifications of any kind between pages. The best way to do it is to pass it in through cookies. Uh, that's totally outside the scope of this particular lesson. We'll get to cookies much later. We now have a more sophisticated uh, generator of HTML here. Let's go on to uh, the next method of generating HTML that is part of the standard library that comes with NIM, and that's using source code filters. Um, let's go ahead and uh, write this up, and I'll be right back. Okay, here we are. We're ready to try this out. Um, we're here at the top. I'm including, not importing, but including registerform.nimf or however that's pronounced, N-I-M-F. It's short for a NIM filter. It's a specially formatted text file containing, well, I'll show you. <laughs> it's a little bit different than a typical NIM program. The first line in a source code filter is uh, this standard line here at the top. And we're using a standard template. And actually details for this can be found here in the documentation of NIM. How to, how to write these and the different notations. Uh, but this tells us that we have a substitution character, a dollar sign, so anything we're doing with a substitution, such as uh, printing an error message variable, this begins with this dollar sign. And our meta character is typically the comment symbol. And the reason you t keep it that way typically is that the way this works is that everything in this file that is a comment will be turned into code. And just the opposite will happen. Anything that's not a comment will be turned into a string. So here we are. We have the start of our procedure, but yet it's commented. And here we're starting with our HTML document. And we have all the standard information here, but we've embedded some code in comments in the middle. So for error message in error list, because it's passing on a sequence of strings in error list, it will print out the individual items inside this unnumbered list. Notice that I have n4 and n diffs here. Actually I have, oh yeah, here, make it more readable here. 
Um, I have an if statement up here, so I'm not going to... I have an if statement, and here's the matching end if. I have a for statement and a matching end for. You wouldn't normally see this in NIM source code because NIM uses indentation to determine uh, block levels and context, but in, in scope specifically. But that doesn't really work in a source code filter because you can't control the formatting of this thing very well. So for here, you would actually have matching if, end if, and for, end for statements. So that's a little bit different than traditional NIM code. Uh, but otherwise, most of the rest of it's the same. And notice I'm, I'm freely mixing uh, code, which is commented, with non-code strings, which are not commented. And uh, so let's go ahead and uh, save our work here and try it out. It worked. Okay, let's run it. Let's go back to our book club. Let's get to our plain register form. Okay, good so far. Missing at symbol. It's working so far. Uh, let's try the two at symbol thing with spaces. There we go. So working just like before. And of course, this comes with the NIM standard library, so nothing new to import. Next, we're going to jump and take a look at the Carex library. But before I start coding, I probably should explain that Carex is intended to be used for a JavaScript front end, that it is what the, the bread and butter of Carex is. We're not using it that way. Uh, because the library needs to manipulate the DOM, the uh, HTML document, that is part of a web page, it has the ability to generate HTML in a using its built-in uh, domain-specific language, or DSL. So we're going to use that DSL, even though we're not compiling this to JavaScript, we're compiling it to C. Uh, we're going to take advantage of the fact that it can generate uh, HTML so cleanly and very efficiently. Um, so let's get to coding, and I'll show you what I mean. All right, let's take a look at this new code. Here we're importing Carex. Now, Carex is a Nimble library, so you'll have to go to Nimble to get it. Looking further down into the code, here we're setting uh, a variable called uh, vnode to build HTML, which is the start of our DSL, our domain-specific sp language, which builds the uh, basically builds the whole DOM. Here we're starting with uh, the head. Here's the title and the text inside of it called Book Club. Here's the body. Here's an H3 with a register. Um, plain text onto the screen. If the error list length is greater than zero, put in a uh, paragraph entry and say errors found. And here's an unnumbered list. And for each text string inside the error list, put a new link item, excuse me, a new list item into the list. and put some bolded text with the actual content of the message in it. Um, so this will list one or more messages inside the unnumbered list, but only if the length of the error list is greater than zero. Otherwise, none of this will actually happen. Uh, now we've got the uh, form with all the entries in there. We've got a button. Notice the uh, back ticks on type again. Because um, that's again the keyword, so you have to let the compiler know you're not really trying to define a data type right here. You're using the name type as an identifier. Uh, type text, name, email. Let's get pretty this up a bit. Uh, here we got a button with the text send email address, and then we turn that into a string, which generates the HTML right there, and away we go. Uh, everything else down here is unchanged because we've got the same procedure with the same parameters and the same return type. So all should be ready to go, assuming my procedure is properly written. Let's try it out. Nope, something's wrong. Undeclared identifier, register form. Oh, register form page. Oh. <laughs> uh, I could do it either way. Let's do... There we go. I renamed it the register form. 
Okay. Let's run it. Okay, let's load it up. Plain text, no good. Empty string, no good. And it's missing an at symbol. Uh, a at space at, I'll have two other errors. There we go. And of course, if we type in something legit, or <laughs> pseudo legit, away it goes. So we've now seen three different ways we can generate HTML inside NIM. Uh, but before we go, let me show you how to generate uh, JSON and XML responses. And then after that, we'll jump to the next video and we'll do the Mustachio library. Okay, I've added a little text here. Uh, add another route, uh, which is prefaced with API. It's a pretty common practice for an API. Uh, version 1, again, uh, versioning is very common practice for APIs. Uh, so for me and the club list, so this would be my, assuming I'm logged in, my personal club list. Um, I'll go ahead and hard code a response here. So parse XML and I'm parsing in this XML. And then I am turning that into a string. So basically, I could almost have just sent the string as is, but um, let's just roll with it as it is. And then I need to set the content type. It's really as simple as that. JSON is nearly identical. I'll show that in a second. Um, let's run this and make sure it works. Oh, I better include the XML library, shouldn't I? Okay, importing an XML tree, XML parser, that's part of the standard library, so no need to install anything. All right, and let's go to our API. Whoops. I guess I better compile and run it first. And there we go, we got our club list, XML's been returned, and here's my two entries that I just made up. By the way, you're probably wondering, shouldn't you be pulling this from a database? Eh, that'll be in video number four. We'll get to that pretty soon. Let's go ahead and switch this out to JSON. JSON's actually considerably easier. As you can see here, JSON's even easier because the library, the Jester library, has built-in support for JSON. So basically, uh, you build your JSON here, or I'm parsing basically the same information, and I'm simply returning the JSON object. So uh, let's test this out. All right, I'll refresh the same page, and now it's coming back with JSON. And here's my list with two entries in it. Next, we'll be doing the Mostashu templating library, which is going to be uh, far more sophisticated. I'm taking up a whole episode for it because we're going to be using this for the rest of the series, and it is considerably more sophisticated. It allows you to have separate HTML files that can include other HTML files, and, uh, well, it's typical of a, of a file-based templating engine. Uh, we'll take a look at that next. Thank you for watching.